Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans, and in this special video, I will be discussing the theme 607 BCE and 1914, why these dates matter to Jehovah's Witnesses. If you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, these two dates are extremely important to you whether you think about them much or not. The purpose of this video is to explain the relationship between them and briefly examine the reliability of claims regarding 607 BCE in particular. We'll begin with the most recent of these two dates, 1914. Like many who were raised as witnesses, my parents brought me up to believe that 1914 was when Jesus was enthroned in heaven, at which point he hurled Satan and his demons down to earth. This teaching is briefly depicted in the back of the 2013 revised edition of the New World Translation. The period of Satan being let loose on earth is described in Revelation 12 verse 12 as a short period of time. A short period of time that has been going on for over a hundred years. Once Satan was hurled down to earth, the last days apparently started with a bang in the First World War, and the ensuing period of over a century until now is considered by witnesses to be the last days before Armageddon. To the Watchtower Society, 1914 is therefore a crucial date. Without it, you have no last days, no Armageddon, no prophetic link between Bible chronology and the present day, no urgent need for a faithful slave to issue spiritual food, and no means of establishing 1919 as the year Jesus selected the Watchtower Society as Jehovah's organization. In short, 1914 is the foundation for all claims Watchtower makes about itself and the times in which we live. Now, everyone knows that 1914 happened to be the year that the First World War erupted in Europe. But apart from that, what is the basis for Watchtower's claims regarding that year? Well, this brings us to our second crucial date for Jehovah's Witnesses, 607 BCE. 607 BCE is the year the governing body insists Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylonian forces on behalf of King Nebuchadnezzar. I might as well drop the bombshell now early in the video. Jehovah's Witnesses are the only ones who think Jerusalem was destroyed in 607 BCE. Any knowledgeable, unbiased historian will tell you that this event can be reliably dated 20 years later to 587 BCE for reasons I shall explain later. But the governing body in its publications stubbornly clings to 607 BCE regardless. Why is this? The magic number we need to answer this question is 2,520. There is a gap of exactly 2,520 years between 607 BCE and 1914. But why all the fuss about 2,520 years? Where does this number come from? It's rather complicated, but it all starts with a verse in the Bible in the book of Daniel, chapter 4. In this verse, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and gets the prophet Daniel to interpret it for him. The dream is about an immense tree, a tree so big that it is visible to the ends of the whole earth, which, by the way, would only be possible if the earth were flat, but that's maybe a subject for another video. Anyway, in this dream, a holy one descends from heaven and orders the tree to be cut down and its branches sawn off. The stump of the tree is to be left in the ground and capped with iron and copper, presumably to stop it from growing again. The Holy One then says something interesting. Let its heart be changed from that of a human, and let it be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over it. Daniel 4.16 This is clearly no ordinary tree. Apart from the fact that it is visible on all continents simultaneously, this tree has a human heart that will be changed to the heart of a beast for a period described as seven times. What we have is a very strange dream and King Nebuchadnezzar wanted answers. He asked Daniel to explain it for him and this was Daniel's explanation. 
you will be driven away from among men, and your dwelling will be with the beast of the field. And you will be given vegetation to eat, just like bulls, and you will become wet with the dew of the heavens, and seven times will pass over you, until you know that the Most High is ruler in the kingdom of mankind, and that he grants it to whomever he wants. Daniel 4.25 So this is no ordinary dream about a psychedelic tree. Daniel reluctantly informs Nebuchadnezzar that the dream was a premonition. He, Nebuchadnezzar, is the tree, and at some point he will go mad and behave like an animal for a period of seven times. While he is away eating grass and generally embarrassing himself, his kingdom will be kept safe for him until he returns. But is this the only interpretation of the dream? Might there be a grander, more important fulfilment? Daniel 4 verse 28 puts it simply. All of this befell King Nebuchadnezzar. We are told that one year after the dream, while walking on the roof of his palace and boasting about how great he is, Nebuchadnezzar hears a voice coming down from heaven, sentencing him to be driven away from mankind to behave like an animal for seven times. Precisely how long were these seven times? Most people assume it was seven years, but whether it was seven years, seven weeks, or seven hours, the point is this. According to the Bible itself, this premonition had only one intended fulfillment. A Babylonian king would go crazy and eat grass for a while. If there is a greater, more grand fulfillment involving, say, the next two and a half millennia of human history, the Bible is silent on this, even though the writer of Daniel could easily have stated this plainly. Frankly, we could just stop the video here, because if this Bible verse has no clearly stated alternative application, there is no need to assign any other special meaning to it, let alone elaborate prophetic speculation about Armageddon and the times we're living in now. But we're going to press on, because unfortunately, 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses around the world orient their lives around a mistaken, albeit sincere belief that this verse does have a grander meaning. To them, the tree wasn't just Nebuchadnezzar, it was a symbol of God's rule over the earth. And the period for which it was cut down denotes the span of history between the last king of Judah and Jesus returning to restore divine rule over the earth again. But what many Jehovah's Witnesses don't realize is that this second meaning has been superimposed onto the Bible by various Christian writers since long before their religion was even conceived. As far back as 1823, a man named John Aquila Brown suggested that the seven times referred to in Daniel chapter 4 meant a period of 2,520 years. This number was arrived at using verses in Revelation chapter 12 to assign a figure of 360 years to each so-called time, so that seven times of 360 years totaled 2,520 years. Other writers latched onto Brown's work and used the magic 2520 number to come up with all sorts of exotic dates for Christ's second coming, or the end of the world as we know it. Arguably the most famous example was William Miller, the founder of the Adventist movement. Miller and his followers produced an illustrated chart using the 2520 figure to show that Christ would definitely absolutely, positively be returning in 1843, which was later revised to 1844. 1844 went down in history as the year of the great disappointment due to the failed expectations of Miller's followers, some of whom sold all their belongings in anticipation of a rapture that would never happen. Among those disappointed Adventists were characters like George Storrs 
and Nelson Barber, whose respective brushes with Adventism and end-time chronology would go on to have a major influence on one Charles Taze Russell. Russell, of course, being the founder of the Bible student movement, which later gave rise to Jehovah's Witnesses. Interestingly, Russell was by no means the first to factor the magic 2520 number into his end-time computations and end up with 1914. In a book published coincidentally in 1844, the year of the Great Disappointment, a preacher and Bible scholar named Edward Bishop Elliot suggested that 1914 might be the expected date for the apocalypse. He wrote, of course, if calculated from Nebuchadnezzar's own accession and invasion of Judah, BC 606, the end is much later, being 1914. So, Russell and his followers were not the first to predict things of biblical proportions to happen that year. If we include Eliot's quote, 1914 was suggested in print in connection with the 2520 years at least three times by different writers between 1844 and 1875. If you want to include years surrounding 1914, such as 1917, 1919 or 1915, the list gets much, much longer. But the point is, at least three writers before Russell pointed to 1914 as a potential deadline for the end. One of these writers, who I've already mentioned, was none other than Nelson Barber, an Adventist writer whose end-time chronology caught the eye of Russell in 1876 and who strongly influenced his teachings moving forward. Before meeting Barber, Russell apparently had little appetite for trying to extract apocalyptic end-time predictions from Bible verses. He was understandably wary of anything associated with the Millerites or Adventism after a succession of embarrassing failed prophecies regarding the end of the world. This reticence may have had something to do with him famously walking out of a Second Adventist sermon by Jonas Wendell. We'll probably never know for sure. What we do know is that Russell received a copy of the Herald of the Morning from Nelson Barber and, suitably impressed, arranged for Barber to come meet with him to explain the evidence for his chronology, which, as we've learned, was itself borrowed from other sources. Russell wrote in the July 15, 1906 Watchtower, He came, and the evidence satisfied me. And so from that point forward, Russell became arguably the loudest advocate for a 2,520 year period of Gentile times, or period of rule by governments not backed by God, beginning in 606 BCE and ending in 1914. By now you have hopefully noticed that 606 BCE and 607 BCE are not the same. The reason for the deviation is quite simply an accounting error. If you put 1914 in your calculator and you subtract 2520, you get 606. But once you factor in that there was no year zero, in other words, 1 BCE ended and 1 CE or AD began, you arrive at 607. Interestingly, all early Russell writings, including studies in the scriptures, refer to 606 BCE rather than 607 BCE, as you can see in this copy of The Time Is At Hand. It wasn't until long after 1914 that the mistake was realised and rectified. And because 1914 was a year in which something big did happen, Watchtower made sure that this year remained untouched rather than some date in the ancient past that nobody could remember. Here is how the mistake is explained on page 105 of the Revelation Climax book. Providentially, those Bible students had not realized that there is no zero year between BC and AD. Later, when research made it necessary to adjust BC 606 to 607 BCE, the zero year was also eliminated, so that the prediction held good at AD 1914. 
Naturally, we're not told what this research was or why it became necessary to adjust 606 to 607 BCE. In the absence of any transparency, the most likely explanation is that 606 was changed to 607 BCE because they realized there was no year zero, and 1914, the start of World War I, was the date that they needed to keep untouched. In other words, the date for Jerusalem's destruction is calculated solely by counting back 2,520 years from 1914. Or is it? You see, 1914 is not the only anchor point that gets you to 607 BCE. There is another, and that is a third important date in our discussion, 539 BCE. Unlike 607 BCE, Watchtower and historians both agree on what happened in 539 BCE. 539 saw the capture of Babylon by Persian forces under Cyrus the Great, as attested by mountains of archaeological evidence. But unlike historians, Watchtower points to 539 BCE as evidence proving their date, 607 BCE, saw the destruction of Jerusalem. How do they argue this? Put simply, they misapply a scripture in Jeremiah that refers to a 70-year period and insist this period describes the desolation of Jerusalem following its destruction by Nebuchadnezzar. So if you count forward 70 years from 607 BCE, you get to 537 BCE, which is only two years on from the capture of Babylon by Cyrus in 539 BCE. Since Cyrus issued his decree releasing the Jews from captivity in 538 BCE, it would have taken them at least a year to walk back from Babylon and start rebuilding Jerusalem in 537 BCE, thus ending the period of desolation, or so Watchtower argues. 539 BCE therefore becomes, as I said before, a second anchor point for 607 BCE. The problem is, Jeremiah never said Judah and Jerusalem would lie desolate for 70 years. He said Judah and all the surrounding nations would serve Babylon for 70 years, which is something altogether different. So long as the Jews living under Babylonian occupation behaved themselves and paid a regular tribute, everything would go well and Jerusalem would remain in one piece. But this is evidently not what happened. After repeated skirmishes and uprisings against their Babylonian overlords, the rebellious Jews were defeated, Jerusalem was besieged and destroyed. Here is what it says in Jeremiah 25 verses 11 and 12. And all this land will be reduced to ruins and will become an object of horror. And these nations will have to serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. But when 70 years have been fulfilled, I will call to account the king of Babylon and that nation for their error, declares Jehovah, and I will make the land of the Chaldeans a desolate wasteland for all time. Notice two things. Firstly, the 70-year period begins with Judah and surrounding nations entering service to the king of Babylon. And we know Jerusalem was under subjection to Babylon long before it was destroyed. And secondly, the prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 25 explicitly mentions the 70-year period ending with the king of Babylon being called to account. We know the king of Babylon was called to account in 539 BCE. So going backwards 70 years from this date would take us to 609 BCE rather than 607 BCE. But since you can't get to 1914 from 609 BCE, 609 BCE is of no interest to Watchtower. So, we've established that neither 539 BCE nor 1914 can be relied on as anchors to get to 607 BCE for the destruction of Jerusalem. 
One of these events is arrived at through a magic number of 2520, which is itself a product of 19th century pseudo-scholarship surrounding fanciful end-time predictions. The other Ankhidate, the capture of Babylon in 539 BCE, rests on a misinterpretation of a prophecy in Jeremiah which referred to Jerusalem serving Babylon for 70 years, not lying desolate for that entire period. This leaves us with a question. If neither 539 BCE nor 1914 have anything to do with 607 BCE, could it be that we can find support for that date elsewhere? After all, since 607 BCE is such a very long time ago, who's to say Jerusalem wasn't destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in that year? And the evidence is waiting for us if we will only go digging for it. Well, as it happens, though 607 BCE was indeed an awfully long time ago, it turns out our knowledge of what did or didn't happen in that year isn't as murky as you might expect. To put it another way, if you were going to just invent a year for something really big to happen in the ancient past, such as the siege and destruction of a major city, the last period you would choose would be the Neo-Babylonian era. Why? Because the ancient Babylonians were nerds when it came to keeping records. They kept records of every conceivable thing that might happen. And these records included not just dates, but means of independently verifying those dates. Let's forget about 539 BCE and 1914 for a moment and approach this from a fresh, more investigative angle. When does the Bible claim the destruction of Jerusalem occurred? To find the answer, we need to go to 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 8 and 9. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that is, in the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the chief of the guard, the servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned down the house of Jehovah, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. He also burned down the house of every prominent man. So there we have it, a true anchor date. In order to get to the actual date for the destruction of Jerusalem, all we need to do is find out when Nebuchadnezzar became king and count forward 19 years from then. Luckily, our nerdy ancient Babylonian friends can help us with that. As mentioned, the ancient Babylonians were obsessed with record keeping and left us with almost too much information about what was going on and exactly when it was going on during the Neo-Babylonian period. Their main way of doing this was using cuneiform tablets, slabs of clay inscribed with wedge-shaped markings before being hardened either in a kiln or in the sun. In fact, here's a piece of trivia for you. The word cuneiform is derived from the Latin cuneus, or wedge, and forma, which means shape. Cuneiform tablets were used to document more or less everything that went on in normal day-to-day -day life, from buying and selling, to household affairs, to financial disputes, to noteworthy national events. Today, we have an estimated 50,000 cuneiform texts for the Neo-Babylonian period dating from 627 BCE to 539 BCE, with different tablets documenting dates and events for every year of every king over that period. In other words, we have more information about this period in history than we really need. When we put all these tens of thousands of ancient clay documents together, they all correspond seamlessly with each other, giving us a complete harmonious timeline of Neo-Babylonian history. The chronology they provide us with is absolutely watertight, so much so that every single year and month is accounted for. There is no room to insert extra years if you wanted to tamper with a certain date. Even the transitions from one king to the next are confirmed beyond any reasonable doubt. You might be thinking, okay, so far I'm impressed, 
but how can we possibly know when these documents were written if they were written on bits of clay thousands of years ago? Isn't it just a matter of opinion as to what dates we assign them? Well, this is where astronomy comes in. When you look up at the sky on a clear night and observe the relative positions of major constellations, you are observing a pattern, a cosmic fingerprint that will not be repeated for thousands of years. If you were to go outside tonight and carefully note the positions of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, all planets known to the Babylonians, relative to the major constellations, and if you were to throw in some clue as to your approximate location, altogether what you would have is a permanent record of the exact date when you made those observations. The pattern you would be describing would take thousands of years to repeat itself. Even if you wrote nothing else and didn't mention the date, the year, the name of your president or prime minister, future astronomers would still be able to pinpoint your exact date using computer models of the movement of planets. So what we need is a tablet that gives us that kind of information, a clear astronomical time marker preferably recorded within Nebuchadnezzar's reign, so we can calculate exactly when Nebuchadnezzar started ruling, and hence find our date for his 19th year and the destruction of Jerusalem. Say hello to VAT4956. VAT4956 is a cuneiform text now on show in a Berlin museum, which lists no less than 30 positions for the moon and five positions of the planets for the 37th year of Nebuchadnezzar. When we take all these lunar and planetary positions and we run them through astronomical analysis, we find they can only fit one period in history, namely 568 567 BCE. There is simply no other year these could correspond to. It would take thousands of years for all these observations to once again match up with the same configuration of moon, stars and planets. So now we know Nebuchadnezzar's 37th year was definitely 568-567 BCE. This means Nebuchadnezzar's 19th year, in which he destroyed Jerusalem, was 587 586 BCE. This is our absolute tried and trusted rock solid date for the destruction of Jerusalem, not 607 BCE, which was 20 years later. So, to recap, 1914 and 539 BCE are both used as anchors by Watchtower to support 607 BCE for the destruction of Jerusalem. 1914 is dubious for two reasons. Firstly, because the verses in Daniel 4 only suggest one application of the tree dream, not a grander fulfillment involving Armageddon. And secondly, because the 2520 year time frame is a cringeworthy vestige of 19th century Adventist pseudo-scholarship that is famous only for producing a steady stream of false apocalyptic predictions. On the other hand, the 539 BCE anchor relies on a misinterpretation of the 70 years referred to in Jeremiah as being a period of desolation rather than subjugation to Babylon. And if the 70-year subjugation was supposed to end with the defeat of Babylon's king in 539 BCE, this doesn't explain the relevance of 537 BCE. Then, when we strip away both these dates and try to make 607 BCE stand on its own two feet, we find that historians are unanimous in saying the destruction of Jerusalem was actually in 587 BCE a date attested by overwhelming evidence including tens of thousands of cuneiform texts, the dates of which harmonize with each other and are verified by observations of astronomical phenomena that would take thousands of years to replicate. 
When historians say that Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 587 BCE, they really are not just plucking a date from thin air. We know more about this period of history than we do about the history of more recent civilizations thanks to the meticulous record keeping of the ancient Babylonians. I don't know about you, but I find myself feeling a huge wave of gratitude to those folks living two and a half thousand years ago in ancient Babylon for keeping such careful notes about what was going on in the sky above them. Careful notes that have greatly assisted us living in the distant future with our problem-solving exercise. But by now you are probably thinking, if the case against 607 BCE is so cut and dried, why does Watchtower continue to freely use the date in its publications rather than crawling under a rock in utter humiliation? Well, the answer is simple. They don't expect you to do the research. And even if you do the research, they expect you to swallow their rewriting of history regardless. An example of the governing body's refusal to concede defeat in the face of overwhelming archaeological evidence and willingness to resort to all kinds of intellectual dishonesty in support of their teachings can be found in two recent articles defending 607 BCE. These articles were published in the October 1st and November 1st 2011 issues of The Watchtower and most of the arguments presented amount to little more than conspiracy theories. Rather than dissect these two articles point by point, for the sake of time I will instead recommend that you Google the name Carl Olaf Jönsson. Jönsson is unquestionably the leading authority on Watchtower's fixation with 607 BCE. And in the following video, filmed some years ago, he explains how he first became involved with the subject. I didn't question this chronology in the beginning because I thought the Bible supported it. I knew, of course, that uh, Historians uh, dated the, the desolation of Jerusalem not in 607, but in 587 uh, or 586. But uh, in 1968, I conducted a Bible study with a man who wanted to know why historians, they uh, preferred the date 20 years later. Uh, so I started to investigate the matter. Jönsson's investigations proved that the evidence against 607 BCE was conclusive, so he decided to write to the governing body with a carefully written essay detailing his research. But Jönsson's essay wasn't as well received as he'd hoped. After receiving back a written warning not to share his findings, Jönsson soon found himself disfellowshipped for daring to question Watchtower's chronology. Ironically, an organisation that claims to not worship God with dates and years in mind had little hesitation punishing someone who dared to question its dates and years. Yun Sun's essay came to be published in book form as The Gentile Times Reconsidered, an amazing book that really leaves no stone unturned in thoroughly debunking 607 BCE using more than 14 lines of evidence against Watchtower's manufactured date. Yun Sun has since gone on to write more on the subject, including two shorter essays as direct rebuttals to the 2011 Watchtower articles, both of which you can download for free on jwfacts.com. A link will be in the description. I for one am extremely grateful to Yun Sun for his painstaking research and for wading into detailed point-by-point -point rebuttals against Watchtower and its apologists so that nobody else has to. Suffice to say, there is much more that can be said and researched on this subject, and I've done my best to give you the briefest of overviews. The amount of time and energy you are willing to devote to 607 BCE really depends on how willing you are to beat a dead horse. After all, we are clearly talking about a single religion defending its clearly biased teachings 
against the consensus of Neo-Babylonian historians and archaeologists. Ultimately, it all comes down to faith and belief. If you want to believe something badly enough, you will believe it regardless of the most compelling evidence to the contrary. But if you are intellectually honest and don't want to be taken for a fool so easily, you will base your conclusions on evidence. If evidence is what you really care about, there is simply no reason to believe any of the governing body's claims regarding 607 BCE or 1914. And once those dates are set aside, the whole house of cards collapses. But just because there is no basis for the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses doesn't mean there is no basis for your life and future. You can find happiness and meaning in the freedom that comes with finally being able to think for yourself. You are the master of your own history, and you can make the most of your life now, rather than waiting for some utopia that's always just around the corner and has been ever since some businessman in Pennsylvania started publishing his borrowed ideas about 607 BCE and 1914 in a magazine. If you've enjoyed this video, please do consider subscribing for more, and as always, thank you for watching.